right, good morning. Hey, we are glad you're here. Just want to take a moment and welcome you and just say we are super, and I've got my computer going over there because we're uh, streaming online and it's a little behind. That's the noise you're hearing over there. So <laughs> thank you, Dave, for taking care of that. Hey, we're glad you're here. I just want to take a moment, welcome each of you, and, and just say thank you for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us. If you're joining us online from wherever that might be, we want to welcome you uh, as well. So uh, if you're visiting with us, we'd love to just say an extra special welcome to you. We'd love to know you're with us today. When you came in, hopefully you received a little handout. Inside that handout, there's a card that looks just like this. It's a connection card, and we'd love to connect with you in any way that we possibly could. So if you just take a moment. Fill that out, and you can drop that. There's a little wood box in our giving center. Just drop that in that box on your, your way out. And if there's ways that we can minister to you, pray for you, we'd love to, to participate in that if, if you allow us to. We'd be privileged to do that. So uh, we're excited today. Today's Baptism Sunday here at Northbridge. We're super excited about that. As we get to see people just take a step forward in their faith and their testimony and, and what God has done uh, in their lives. And Pastor Dave uh, is, is going to be bringing us a, a message today, a great message of encouragement today. And so I know you guys will be encouraged. So go ahead, take a moment to stand to your feet and greet some folks around you if you would.
Would you hear the hearts of your people and as we worship you? May, may you've heard a spirit that is true and honoring of your name, God. God, we thank you for what we're about to celebrate, the baptisms of, of these lives, God. We are just so thankful and honored to be able to, to uh, participate in this, uh, to watch as these uh, uh, individuals uh, claim your name through the example of bap baptism and demonstrate uh, their love for you life change for you. God, we are grateful uh, for this privilege, and, and we, God, we want to honor that as best we can. And Father, as we uh, open your word in just a few moments, God, would you just speak through Dave? Uh, would you pierce our hearts with uh, your word? It's in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and you can be seated. We'll get the lights up here, and I want to also welcome you to Northbridge Church, whether you're in this room physically with us or you're gathered around through the four corners of the world on iCampus, we say welcome to you as well. We're having a very special day today in which we get to celebrate and uh, uh, the faith journey of a bunch of people. Uh, first hour we baptized Claire and I told I told first hour we'd be sure to share her baptism with you and as I shared about this hour with first hour. Uh, so we took care of that, and now the first one on deck is Cody. Cody, how are you doing today? Good. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. And Cody has some family here, right? Mom, Dad, why don't you kind of come up here? Don't look in the background. I want you to come up here so you can see this, okay? And, and Cody, you have some brothers and sisters here, correct? I mean, there's some brothers. Well, just kind of show yourself, okay? If you take Cody as a family member, let's, let's see a hand raise. Okay. Hey, Cody. Quit twirling around on me here. Stand next to me, buddy. <laughs> okay? Thanks, pal. So Cody came to me a few, uh, what, probably six weeks ago or so, five weeks ago, and, and he and his mama, and, and uh, he shared with me about how a while back ago he prayed to ask Jesus into his heart and his life. He asked Jesus to forgive him of his sins. He asked Jesus to, uh, to, to take him by the hand and, and be his leader, be his boss for the rest of his life. And, and I got to visit with him, and I, I grilled you pretty hard, didn't I, Cody? And uh, by the time we got done, I, I thought I probably need to come to Christ because Cody <laughs> was, was absolutely convinced. He shared so well about what sin was and about his need for a Savior, and it was very compelling, buddy. And, uh, and I thank you. that It was a special day for me to get to be a part of that. And, uh, and so we're here today. And what we were reminded of and what Cody knows and what I just make sure we're all clear about here is that we believe at this church that baptism is a symbol. It's like a wedding ring. I could lose my ring today and I'm still married to my wife because it's just an outward expression of something that's going on inside my heart. And that's what baptism is. There's some people that believe and some faiths that teach that someone walks into these waters lost far from God and they come out of these waters saved and, and right with God. We believe that these waters are just waters that the reality is Cody came into these waters already a child of God because of his prayer and calling upon Jesus to be his Lord. And now what we're doing is celebrating that as an outward sign. It's an outward step of faith that Jesus asked us to take. And So with that in mind, everything I've said today, Cody, if I've been telling the truth, yeah, okay. So what I want you to do is hold my hand like a baseball bat. Remember that? Remember how that? And grab that other hand, buddy. I need both your hands here. Like that. There you go. And so now, hey, if you get nervous, you just squeeze on that arm, okay? So with all the things that we've said, Cody, I am so proud and honored that I get to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Caleb and Kylie. Kaylee, I caught myself, Kaylee. 
So same story here. Bert, you know, and here, this is amazing to me. You know what that guy's because they were on the stage just a year or two ago in baby dedication. We dedicate. I'm just joking about that. For, for the <laughs> years and years ago, we got to dedicate these two uh, when we first came into this facility, pretty much, right? Pretty brand new facility at that point. And here we'll, we're full circle now and baptizing them because they both uh, have a profession of faith. They both prayed to ask Jesus to come into their hearts and and to come into their lives. And now we're just celebrating with them and with their family uh, the ordinance of baptism that, that you guys know. We've talked about this already. This is a symbol. And so based on your testimony, we're going to baptize you today. Now, I just ask you guys, I've told the truth, haven't I, that you've asked Jesus into your heart, into your lives? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So, Haley, what I'm going to do is take your spot. Okay? You stand behind me here. Or stand, yeah, right over here. And, Caleb, grab my hand. There you go. And so based on the testimony, based on the story that you told me just a few weeks ago, I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will. I will. Before I let you go, I'd go down with you. Grab my hand there, buddy. 
So with that in mind, Chris, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, what we've just witnessed in these last few moments. As we, we shared, Lord, and celebrated with uh, Chris and Calum and Cody and Kaylee their public confession of faith in you. And Father, we're grateful that, Lord, that what you've done in their lives, and Lord, we pray from this moment forward that, that they would be men and women um, of great faith. That, Father, that your hand of anointing would be upon all four of these. That, God, that you would do a great work in and through them. That, Father, that you would just uh, pour out your spirit upon them. And that, Lord, that they would look back on this moment, God, as a means of, Lord, of encouraging them in their salvation and their walk with you. Father, we're grateful, Lord, that we can celebrate, God, what you do in people's lives and how you've changed people not through works, but through the very grace of Jesus Christ. And Lord, now as we turn to your word, may your word speak to us and encourage us in every way possible. And may you, Father God, just remind us again that you are God of all possibilities and that there is nothing at all that's too difficult for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And so uh, we, uh, we're thrilled to... Uh, to be a part of this great celebration today and Claire in the, in the first service. And, and I know that we have lots of uh, uh, first-time visitors with us today. I want to thank you for uh, being a part of our worship service this morning. My name is David, and I serve as one of the, the three pastors at Northbridge. And uh, we, we have the, the blessing of, of sharing the pulpit. Um, so if you don't like what you see today and hear today, come back next week. It'll be a different flavor altogether. So, uh, but again, we're, we're thrilled that you've joined with us in worship today. Excited to see family, but also friends, and it reminds me of, of how much um, uh, we matter in other people's lives, right? I mean, if you wouldn't be here today if you didn't love um, the four that were baptized today, if there was some sort of connection that you had with them. And so it reminds us again about the power of testimony, the power of relationship. If you have a copy of scriptures this morning, I invite you to turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. We've been in a, a series that's going to lead us up to the Easter, um, Easter Sunday morning on, um, <clears throat> on the very last week of Jesus' life. And the title is Crucified and Glorified. And there are some events that takes place in the weeks and the day leading up to Jesus' death on the cross and his eventual resurrection that <clears throat> we need to look at because it's going to encourage us in our faith. And Matthew 26 is a powerful reminder that we serve a God who restores. And I'm not sure where you come from and, and your background in life. But I hope that before you walk out of these doors in, in the next 30 minutes or so, that in some way you'll have a new perspective on the, God, the, the love of God towards you. Back in the 1940s, um, Billy Graham came on the scene. And Billy Graham was probably the greatest, has been told, the greatest evangelist probably of all time. By the time that he ended his uh, public ministry, he had preached in, in over 145 nations around the world. It says that 250 million people would come out over the course of all those years of preaching to hear him speak about the good news of Jesus Christ. But back in the 1940s, Billy Graham kind of lived in the shadow of another great evangelist of his days. In fact, there was an evangelist that God had raised up in the 1930s and the 1940s in America and his name was John, uh, Charles Templeton. And Charles Templeton, uh, people said, if, if, there was, if we were put a bet on, on Billy Graham and Charles Templeton, who would be the one that God would use the most for the sake of the gospel, hands down, Templeton would have won the bet. Templeton was a charismatic personality. He had a, a stage presence. He had a, had a way with words, and, and people were just drawn in and captivated by how he spoke. But something happened in his personal life, and he began to, to doubt. And by the end of the 1940s, Charles Templeton literally walked away from ministry 
But more importantly, he walked away from faith in Christ Jesus. He turned his back on Christ. He became uh, what he would term an agnostic. And he kind of exit stage left, and you didn't really hear much about him. In 2001, uh, there was a book published called um, The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel. And Lee Strobel decided to go and visit and and interview um, uh, Charles Templeton for his book. So he goes to his nursing home and he begins to, to engage him in a conversation. He, he was taken aback because this, he was very congenial and, and everything was just on, on you know, uh, very forthcoming. And so Lee uh, turned the conversation to Jesus and, and he was kind of shocked by, by, by what he had to say because uh, Templeton kind of had a warmth regarding Jesus. He, he believed that Jesus was, a, was the greatest human being to ever live. And Lee was, was struck by that. And so he began to ask him, he sounds like, he says, this is what Lee Strobel said, it sounds like you really care a lot about Jesus. And Templeton replied, I know that this may sound strange, but I adore him. And then Lee said he began to, to weep and sob uncontrol- un- uncontrollably. And he says this, and yet I miss him so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you that there are a lot of people that I can identify with Charles Templeton. Maybe not in his specific situation. But we all face in life, every single one of us, me included, we all face in life these moments that just crush us, these doubts that assail us, these moments in our life, whether it's things that we cause or others have caused towards us that make us want to doubt and begin to walk away and, yes, even desert faith and even desert Jesus along the way. Paul mentions this in, in 1 Timothy, and he says that he reckons this as, as people who shipwreck their faith. Life sometimes can be so hard and difficult and overwhelming to the point where we're like a, like a ship that has run aground, Right? And the good news for us this morning out of Matthew chapter 26 is that there is hope for all of us. If you find yourself this morning doubting, there is hope for you. If you find yourself this morning just dashed upon the rocks of discouragement, if you find yourself this morning dashed upon the rocks of of, of depression, if you're dashed upon the rocks of fear, if you're dashed upon the rocks of you name it, you name the sin, I'm here to tell you today, in fact, God's word is here to tell you today that there is tremendous hope for you. So in Matthew chapter 26, we find ourselves in the the last week of Jesus' life. Um, They had just taken the supper in the upper room, the Passover supper, and and Jesus takes them to the garden of Gethsemane. And so we find in verse 30, the beginning... And we're going to read this. And I'm reading out the New Living Translation. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, it'll be on the screen in front of you. It says in verse 30, Then they sang a hymn <clears throat> and went out to the Mount of Olives. And on the way, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me. For the scripture says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So in other words, Jesus is, about, is, is setting the, temp, the, 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 the scene. He's saying, listen, uh, in the next few hours, your life is going to be forever impacted and changed. And all of you will not stand with me in the end. And he quotes this verse out of Zechariah. He says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Verse 32. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, said Peter. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Now, let's go on down to skip a few verses. We're going to go down to verse 50. Uh, Jesus um, has been praying. The disciples have been sleeping. 
And all of a sudden, there's a commotion in the garden. And in, into the garden comes Judas Iscariot leading a crowd, it says, of armed people. And we pick up the story in verse 15. And Jesus is speaking to Judas Iscariot. He says, he says my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But, but one of the men with Jesus pulled out a sword and struck the high priest's slave. Can someone get me some water? I just got so excited in this uh, baptism. My throat is about parched. But if someone can do that for me, I appreciate that. Uh, but one of the men, verse 51, with Jesus pulled out a sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Thank you, sir. And those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scripture be fulfilled that described what would, must happen now? Pause, let me drink a little water. Thank you. Verse 55, then Jesus said to the crowd, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with the swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day teaching and Jesus said, my friend, Go ahead and do what you have come for. And verse 56, this is powerful. This is powerful. But this all happened to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scripture. At that point, all of the disciples deserted him and fled. What a remarkable scene. Jesus, with these 11 men who were with him for Three years, ate with him, slept beside him, watched him do incredible things, heal people, raise people from the dead, preach that, that of God's love and of God's nearness, of God's salvation. And yet when, when Jesus needed them the most, they could not be counted on. And so they fled. Now, when I read and reread this passage, I was struck by this one thing. Why was this moment prophesied hundreds of years ago in the Old Testament under the ministry of an Old Testament prophet called Zechariah? Because remember, Jesus was speaking, uh, he was repeating the words of Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Why, of all of the events surrounding the, uh, the coming of Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, why is this moment of the disciples deserting Jesus, why was it so important for God, for God to speak to a prophet hundreds of years prior to say that people that were closest to Jesus would deserve him? And the more I thought about this, the, the more I, I'm convinced that the reason why that this is mentioned in prophecy and Jesus speaks it up again in this moment is because we are like these 11 disciples. We can identify with them in their weaknesses. And not only can we identify them in their weaknesses, but we have a great shepherd who is willing, who, yes, who is willing to show mercy and kindness and love and forgiveness and restoration in the midst of our worst moments. Now, I'm not sure if any of you can identify with deserting Jesus like these 11 but I sure can identify with these men when it comes to certain things. I can identify them. We're going to talk about these, these two things in a few moments. We can, I can identify with these 11 in the realm of fear. I can identify with these 11, especially Peter, in the realm of uh, selfish ambition and pride and self-sufficiency. But I'm not sure what you brought into this room this morning and what you struggle with and what you doubt over and what you're overwhelmed with in life. But all I want to tell you in this moment, though that we are, are people who waver and frail in our resolve, we have a great shepherd who is unwavering towards you with tremendous love, tremendous mercy, and tremendous grace. And he will meet you in the midst of your struggle. I don't care what it is. I don't care how long you've been struggling with it. I don't care how, how it has crippled your life. Jesus is faithful enough and loving enough 
and kind enough to meet you at your worst moment and restore you. Now, let me just share with you two things that I see in this passage that we can identify with in regards to where these 11 were. Because we, even though that all of our lives are different and all of our, our lives and our situations are different, there are several things that we, we commonly struggle with. Like I said, we struggle with the fear. And these apostles, they, these disciples, they struggle with, this, with the fear of the unknown. They had no idea what was ahead of them. Now, when Judas came to betray Jesus, he came with this armed group of men. And it says they were there to arrest Jesus. But Mark, the gospel of Mark, kind of gives us a, another uh, interesting look at what was going on in this scene. It says that they also began to lay hands upon the 11 disciples that were with Jesus. And Mark says that, when one, in fact, one man, one disciple, they, when they laid hands upon him, he squirmed and wiggled his way out of his own clothes that he, he ran out of there naked. So these men were under tremendous fears in that moment. They, they, they feared uh, uh, regarding their identity with Jesus and because of their identity with Jesus that as Jesus was going to be tortured, maybe they would be tortured. As Jesus would be put on trial, maybe they would be put on trial. As Jesus might, might receive a, a future punishment, they might receive a future punishment. And in that moment, they became so afraid, so overwhelmed with the situation around them that they literally fled for their lives. And not only did they flee, flee but they deserted the one that they had given their lives to. They deserted the one who, who, who they had proclaimed that, yes, he is the Messiah. They deserted the one who they knew for certain was the, was the king of Israel, was the, was the coming Messiah. And yet in that moment, their fear overwhelmed them to the moment that they deserted Jesus. There's something about this situation I think is very fascinating. That not only the 11 had an issue with the ident identifying with Jesus, but throughout Jesus' ministry, you have people that continue to want to identify with him in private, but when it came to the public identity, they didn't want to have anything to do with the consequences. In John, in, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 12, verse 42, this is, what, this is what John says about people's interaction with Jesus. He says, many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. Verse 43, we don't have it up here, but it says this, for they loved human praise more than they loved the praise from God. And I, I can identify with that in that moment. That's a common struggle that we all face, right? What do people will say about me if I mention Jesus? if I speak about Jesus, if I identify with Jesus. And in fact, in our culture today in America, it's becoming very uh, anti-Christian in regards to the worldview. For there's a lot of pushback when we bring Jesus up in the public arena. There's a lot of fear of, of what, what will happen if I, if I speak and stand for the truth and, and when the word of God is, it goes against the, the cultural norms of the day. And we become frightened and we kind of in the same way, be willing and tempted to deny Christ out of fear. Fear of losing relationships. Fear of losing friendships. Maybe the fear of losing a job. Maybe the fear of being, of being labeled something that you really are not. Maybe you be, you're, you're, you're afraid of being labeled as a weirdo or a wacko, right-wing fundamentalist type, right? So just like these disciples and just like these, these first believers... We have this fear of man that keeps us afraid. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Paul says that this type of fear does not originate from God. In other words, the spirit of God that's within us does not give us this type of fear. It comes from outward pressure, outward circumstances. It comes from within when we begin to doubt, right? But this is what Paul says. Instead of us having this spirit of fear from God, God gives us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. As Christians, we all have our moments in which a decision has to be made in regards to what are we willing to lose in order to be associated with Jesus. 
and we are to stand strong in your identity with Jesus. But if you have given in to the fear of man, don't run from Jesus. If you struggle with some other type of fear in your life, listen, don't run from him. It's in our DNA. I mean, from the very beginning, you go back to Genesis with Adam and Eve in the garden when they fell into sin. What did they just do? It just came upon them naturally. They ran and they hid from God. And, and we see this throughout all the entirety of Scripture when people are in trouble, when people are overwhelmed with life, when people are stricken with great fear, they tend to run from God. And it's the same with you and I. And what are we afraid of? Are we afraid of God punishing us? Are we afraid that God's going to strike us in some way? Are we afraid that, that, that we, will, we will incur his, his wrath in some way? Are we, are we afraid that we have disappointed God? And let me just say this. When I look at the scriptures, I don't see that. I see a God who is recklessly, he, he, he comes after people in unbelievable ways. For those who are very far from him, he, he pursues them. And so don't allow fear to cause you to run away from a God who, who wants to embrace you in all of your fears and speak into your fears and help set you free from your fears in order that you might identify with him much more. So whatever fear you have, Jesus wants to meet you in the midst of your struggle. The second thing that these men uh, faced um, that we can identify with was in the arena of pride. And this is what I think is really powerful. Even after Jesus tells Peter um, that he was going to fall, what was Peter's response? No way, Jose. In fact, I, I was emphatic with the word no, because that's what I pictured Peter saying. I believe G Peter was very emphatic in his response to Jesus, right? And what did Jesus say? And I, I believe it's recorded in, in the gospel of John, it says, Jesus tells, tells Peter, Satan has asked that you be sifted. And not only you, Peter, are going to be sifted, but these other, other ten are going to be sifted with you as well. But Peter was the poster boy for um, this moment of pride. But he also was speaking on behalf, I think, of all the other apostles. Remember in verse uh, 35, what does it say? It says that all of these men, all these men, all the disciples vowed the same thing that Peter vowed. No way, Jose. We are with you, Jesus, to the end. You see, these men had no idea what their spiritual weakness was. They thought more highly of themselves than they ought to have thought of themselves. I, this past week, I was uh, at a gathering of, of other people that work in missions. By the way, I have, an, I have a day job, and I work at, at a local um, uh, mission working with people in recovery and homeless. And I was with uh, other people throughout the state. We kind of gathered together, kind of did like a little small forum. And, and then one of these meetings, uh, a gentleman stood up and he, says, he said, every day that I go to work, um, I, I, give, I give Satan a black eye. Every day that I help a, a homeless person out, um, uh, I, I, I destroy the devil. Every time that I do something within the mission, I take so much pride in that I believe that all hell trembles. And there was, at the moment, there was a lot of amens and hallelujahs going across the room. And I, and I sat there and, and I just, in my heart, I just, I just winced because, you know, I don't think for a moment, I can't see anywhere in scripture that says that the devil is afraid of Dave Myers or anybody else. He's not afraid of my works. He's not afraid of what I do for the poor and the addicted. He doesn't shudder at me, and there's nothing in Scripture that tells me that I give the devil a black eye. But I will say this, what Scripture does speak about in regards to Satan is this. He's a powerful foe. He's more powerful than you and I. We are weak, right? But he's limited in his power. And this is what, this is what the Scripture says. This is what he shakes at. He shakes at the very name of Jesus. He shakes at the very word of God and the word of truth being proclaimed. He shakes at the very authority and the very power of God for there's no one like our God. And he is submissive to, submissive to God's power. Another thing that we see in scripture regarding, regarding him is that he trembles at the very fact when he's reminded that for all of eternity, God has him in chains in Hades 
forever and ever. You see, you see, he is, he trembles at our Savior. He trembles at our God. He doesn't tremble at us. And sometimes we can go around, we can boast about who we are, but remember what the Proverbs says, pride goes before the fall. There's nothing about you and there's nothing about me that makes us so special that we have it all together. No, no in fact, it's, it's the opposite. We are weak, but we have a strong Savior. We are flawed, but we have a flawless God. We are among ourselves sinful, but we have a sinless Savior that will reach out to us in the midst of our weaknesses, in the midst of our pride, in the midst of our great struggle. This morning, some of us struggle with spiritual pride, and we think that we got this, that, God, that we are somebody special, that we are, that we are far from falling. And I'm telling you something, if you're in that place in your life, watch out for the roaring lion is seeking someone to devour and you're next. And so I can identify, I can identify in these two situations with these disciples. I can identify because I've been there. And in fact, and, and this will be a long story, I can't tell this morning, you have to come back another time and hear me speak, but... Um, God set me aside for, for many years in ministry because I, I thought too highly of myself. And, and he put me through a crucible of pain that totally changed my life forever. I don't want you to go through that. Wherever you struggle in in your life, or whatever that, that, pride, that, that prideful issue is in your life, go to Jesus and surrender to him. Now, I told you at the very beginning of this message, and this is a very short message for us this morning, for me this morning. I told you at the very beginning that in the midst of our struggle, whatever that struggle is, here is the whole thing I want you to know from this morning. And that is this. Jesus already knows what you struggle with. Jesus already knows what you deny him with. Jesus already knows your doubts. He already knows your sins. He already knows what goes on in your mind. He already knows the, the moment where you just want to run and hide from him. He already knows this. But this is what I love about this passage. In the midst of all of this, Jesus gives these 11 men hope. He tells them that that, 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 night, he, that that night when they walk away from him, when they desert him, that's not going to be the last of the story. No, that's just the beginning of restoration. Go back with me if you still have your Bibles open in verse 32. In verse 32, this is what, and we read that and we just kind of went over it. But this is probably the most powerful verse in all this passage. It says in verse 32, but after, Jesus is talking, after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and I will meet you there. Now, in this one statement, Jesus is showing and demonstrating his passionate about restoration. He's passionate of, and he loves and he cares for our soul. So much so when he tells his men, listen, listen, you're going to run away from me. You're going to scatter to, to, to different places. But listen, when you hear that I've been resurrected from the dead, meet me in Galilee. Because when you come to Galilee... New life waits you. Now, what's so important about Galilee? Well, Galilee is the place where Jesus did most of his, his public ministry. Galilee is the place where Jesus met all, all these 11 men. At Galilee was where these men made a decision to, to give up what they had in life, to follow him with everything. And Jesus says, I don't want to go back. I don't want your desertion to be the last thing you remember. I don't want, to be, I don't want this, this moment of desertion for this to be the mark of your life. No, I am going to restore you. I am going to forgive you. I'm going to pursue you. And I'll be waiting for you in your Galilee. So the question this morning is this. What is your Galilee? What is your Galilee? Now in, verse, in chapter 28, if you go to Matthew chapter 28, still have your Bibles open, go to Matthew chapter 28. Jesus is the one who keeps his word. Now this is what I think is very powerful. If you, to, if you go to verse 5 in Matthew 28, the women, Jesus has died, um, 
the women, Mary, Mary, they go off to anoint Jesus' body. They get to the tomb. Uh, the, the, the stone's rolled away. Um, the, Jesus is not there, but there's an angel there, and the angel meets him. This is what the angel said to the women. Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and go and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and what? And he is going ahead of you to where? Galilee. Huh? Craziness, right? And you will see him there. And remember, remember what I've told you. Verse 8, the men, the women ran quickly from the tomb and they were very frightened, but, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angels' messages, message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. And then Jesus um, said to them, Don't be afraid. Oh my gosh, look at what was it say? Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee at once, and they will see me there. That is the heart of Jesus. That if you come to a place where you've shipwrecked your faith, Jesus will repair that boat. Jesus will unstuck you. Jesus will restore you. And you don't have to give him to the lie that God hates you that God wants to punish you, that God is disgusted by you, when in fact, it is totally the opposite. I'm here to tell you that no matter where you find yourself at this morning, I don't care who you are or what you've experienced in life, I don't care if you're the most profane man or woman in this room, I'm gonna tell you something, Jesus loves you. And he wants to give you hope. And he wants to restore where the enemy has destroyed in your life. Where people have hurt you. He wants to renew you. Where you're weak. He wants to be your strength. He wants to renew your life. He wants to give you a hope and the promise of not only for life to come here on this earth, but but life eternal. Don't believe the lies of the enemy that says you're not worth it, for you very are worth it. He went to the cross because you're worth it. He carried your sins and my sins upon that tree. That tree was cursed because our sin cursed it. And because he bore our sins and bore our afflictions, we two can be healed. Now there's an old old hymn and I think Dave cried, we're a hip, we kind of, we think we're hip, you know, I, I think I'm a 50 year old hip guy sometimes, I wear a sweater vest, come on, you can't get more hipper than that, right? <laughs> I think David Crowder has kind of changed this, this old hymn up and kind of given it a new flavor, but one of these old hymns I, I love is called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, maybe you've heard that. One of the stanzas um, goes like this, and maybe you can identify with this. I'm going to say before I mention the stanza, the man who wrote this, this hymn was just like Charles Timberton. He, he walked away from God because he was disappointed about a struggle he was dealing with in life. But he came back to him. And when he came back to Jesus, he, he wrote this hymn as a hymn of, of repentance, right? This is what he says. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You see, folks, you know, it's no mystery to God that we are people who will fail. He knows that already. And what he's asking you is to come to this, this conclusion that there's nothing that you can do to rectify your failures, but he has the power to rectify them on your behalf. He asks us to believe in him, 
to trust in him for salvation by placing our faith not in ourselves, but in his son, Jesus Christ. You see, that is the place of tremendous restoration right there. That's where we start, by surrendering our, our hearts, our lives, our doubts, our sin, and we, we say, Jesus, come and save me. But let me say this, life doesn't get easy because you come to faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes it, it gets very hard. In fact, as I get older, life becomes more harder for me. And for us who follow him, we have to begin to say this, where's your Galilee? Where do you need Jesus to meet you at? Where do you need Jesus to restore you? Where do you need Jesus to speak truth into? Where do you need Jesus to change your circumstances? Some of you in this room, I, I, we, we put some cards out that look like this, just little, little strips of, of colored cards, and you might have it in your seat or on the table in front of you, if, unless the first service kind of picked them up. But if not, I encourage you to, to just take out your... Uh, in your bulletin, you have that communication card, and you can do the same thing on the communication card. But we've been doing this throughout this series as a form of invitation and as a response from the people to the Word of God. And this morning, I want this to be our invitation, part of our invitation. If there is a place in your life that you struggle with, that has beat you down, that has held you back, held you down, if there's a lie that you believe, if there is if there's something that you believe that, that God needs to heal, I would love for you just to record that anonymously. We don't need your name on it. Just anonymously say, this is my Galilee. This is where Jesus needs to meet me. And if you'll do us a favor, and we're going to do this and come back to come back in the, in a few weeks from now, we have this great illustration we're going to use with these cards, but but let me just say this. This card is just a testimony of saying, my heart is open for God to do something new in my life. My heart is open to receive his love, to receive his mercy, <laughs> to receive his grace, to receive his unconditional love for me, but I need him to meet me in this Galilee. For all of us in life, life will become like what Charles Templeton, for Charles Templeton, life was too difficult. Questions were too much for him. But before you make that decision to shipwreck your faith, before you make that decision to turn away from Jesus, would you give Jesus an opportunity to meet you where you're at, to meet you in your despair, to meet you in your struggle, to meet you in your unbelief, to meet you in your doubts, and see what he can do? For you. Would you pray with me? Father, we sang this morning already that freedom is in this place. And that freedom, Lord, comes from you. There is no freedom outside of faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we just submit our hearts to you this morning. And we say the Lord that we are no longer slaves to fear. That we who are in Christ are no longer slaves to sin. But our hope and our help is in Jesus Christ. And Father, for that young man or woman that might be in this room this morning that are very, very far from you, that have never reached out in faith to grab a hold of you in salvation, may today be the day of their salvation. We know it to be this simple, Lord, just to cry out to you where they're at, and you will save them. For, Father, for all who call upon your name shall be saved. We thank you, Father, for your, for your word this morning. We thank you, that Lord, that, that you pursue us to no ends, that you help us in all situations, that you're a good shepherd towards us, that you are a mighty God that, God, that you are God of, of tremendous help in our time of need. That though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort us at all times. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
me just say this real quick before the band uh, takes us through this, this closing song. If you're here this morning, there are several pastors. I'm here. Pastor John's over here. Pastor Tony's in the room as well. If you're here today and you believe that you're far from God, but you want to begin your journey with him today, reach out to us. Like I said in my prayer, here's a step right where you're at. You can be saved. You don't have to jump through any spiritual hoops. You just have to call upon the name of Jesus and trust in his son as his savior and as Lord of your life, and you shall be saved. And if you made that commitment this morning, let one of the pastors know. We would love to follow up with you and minister to you. If you have hurts and needs and hang-ups in your life this morning, that you just need someone to walk you through a prayer, ministering in some way, the pastors are here for you as well. But would you just stand to your feet and sing this last song with the worship team?
Amen. Hey, let this team know you appreciate them leading us today. Yeah. Man, what an awesome morning. Has it not, I call it Encouragement Sunday today, right? I mean, how cool is it to see, you know, four lives, just their testimonies and what God has done uh, in their lives as they've just, they've gone forward in baptism. And uh, that is so encouraging to see. It's such a blessing, I think, for all of us to experience that. And, and uh, incredible message from Pastor Dave today, just the encouragement of knowing that no matter where we're at, no matter where, where we find ourselves, that God is there for us to restore us, to bring us back to him, and that he loves us that much. And so, uh, man, I hope you have been encouraged today. I hope you have been blessed today uh, by being here. Hey, just want to say a couple of things. The cards that Pastor Dave told you to uh, give you an opportunity to fill out, uh, just some things in your life that you say, hey, God, this is where you need to meet me. Uh, you can drop those cards in, in there's the wood box over in the giving center. Just drop those in there on your way out. As well as, again, I just encourage you, if you are visiting with us today, again, we'd love to connect with you uh, in any way that we possibly can. If we can be ministering to you or praying for you in any way, uh, please take an opportunity to fill that on your connection card. You can place that in the same uh, little box on your way out the door. A couple of announcements. Uh, if you want to throw some axes, uh, men, this uh, Wednesday evening, uh, meet at Tommy Hawk, and uh, we're going to throw some axes from uh, 6 to 7.30. Is that correct, time? Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that uh, on the, in the table in the cafe area. Hey, if you're visiting with us and you want to throw some axes, feel free to sign up and throw some axes, all right? Uh, it is $20, $25, so uh, we'd love to have you guys uh, join us for that. Also, uh, obviously, this is Easter season. Uh, I want to invite you, if you don't have a home, an Easter home, a church to, to go to during Easter, we'd love to, to have you here with us. Uh, the Saturday before Easter, we have an Easter egg hunt out in our back lawn. Uh, that is at 11 o'clock in the morning, so I invite you to be a part of that, to come and, and participate in that. We'd love to have you as our guest. Uh, again, I hope you've been blessed. Have a great day. Oh, yes. If you're here with Chris, with her guests or family, meet right up here. we got a family pick. <laughs> We're going to have to use the whole stage. <laughs>